Good morning and welcome to uh, this uh, meeting of uh, the 23rd meeting of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. And uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off their mobile phones as they may affect the uh, broadcast systems. Uh, members will be using tablets probably for uh, their uh, work in the committee. And we have apologies from Jim Hume and have been joined this morning by colleagues from European and External Relations Committee so far, Jamie McGregor, and we're expecting Anne McTaggart. Um, and perhaps one of our own members, I'm not sure, still to come. And so we'll, uh, we welcome uh, uh, Phil Hogan and... Uh, Thank you very much for coming to our committee. Perhaps you want to introduce your two uh, sidekicks. Yes, Dermot, Dermot Ryan, uh, member of my cabinet, and Tom Tyne, member of my cabinet. Very They're good. both Irish, so don't hold that against them. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no harm in that at all. Uh, very much welcome to see you here. Uh, we're going to try and uh, cover things between now and about 5 to 10 uh, this morning. So we want to keep short questions and short answers, if at all possible. Um, the item one is to, first of all, before we start that, is the decision on taking business in private, and uh, we've got to, uh, to have agreement about that so that our next meeting on the 24th of June uh, we'll be dealing with our work programme, and uh, that's something which uh, we'll be planning a large amount of work to do with land reform and many other things as we move into the autumn. So the second item today uh, is to welcome Phil Hogan and his uh, cabinet members and uh, to probably question some uh, excuse me a minute I've been suffering from a cold so I need to sort of do things in order I have to get you to agree that we move into private uh, in uh, the 24th to discuss our work program are we all agreed, agreed. very good I thought we might but uh, I suppose you have to confirm these things um, we welcome the commissioner because uh, it is a a prestigious Highland show that takes place just now, but also it's the time of uh, the bedding in of the new cap, and uh, obviously something which uh, Phil Hogan has inherited himself. Um, after I ask a first question, I'm going to bring in Dave Thompson because he has to go <coughs> soon uh, about a, a fairly local matter in the Highlands, but after that we'll try and go round uh, the houses. And um, given that you've uh, just inherited the structure of the cap. I don't know what you think about its, um, its actual provenance. Do you think it's simpler? Do you think it's more complicated? Do you think it's going to be fit for purpose? And what direction is it moving in? Well, thank you very much, Chairman, for being here. I'm very glad to accept the invitation of your Cabinet Sec Secretary, Richard Lockheed, to attend the Royal Highland Show. I understand it's one of the the best and the biggest in UK and perhaps Europe. So I, I'll be able to adjudicate on that, I'm sure, later on, uh, after a long, a long day. Um, the Common Agricultural Policy is something, as you rightly point out, that I inherited from people that are much more astute than I am in terms of politicians and council ministers and members of the European Parliament who agreed all this. And, of course, I've never met as many people uh, since that want to make some adjustments to it, but that's understandable. It's... It's, uh, you know, it's the nature of, of things that uh, you know, not everything worked out maybe as they intended. So we are actually in the process of implementation. We've made some changes already to the guidelines, which will hopefully will assist in greater clarification on problems that were emerging on the greening element of the CAP implementation. Uh, and we are going down the road of a more market-orientated policy that takes account more significantly of the environmental issues. Promotion policy, quality policy, uh, new market opportunities. This is the, the, the type of direction uh, that we're heading in. And uh, we acknowledge the fact that uh, Scottish food and drink industry is outstripping all others in the UK and doing a fantastic job uh, in their export opportunities and also <coughs> developing future potential for exports. And uh, we have some ideas around that where we, can, we may be able to help. So I look forward to you know, engaging with the rural, rural stakeholders and indeed the rural community during the course of the day. And I've already met 
your farm organisations and people that are key people in the food and drink industry last evening for a discussion. Uh, and I'm familiar with some of the teething problems that the Scottish farmers are having in relation to implementation as well. Uh, but we'll try and work together to see can we tease those out and resolve some of the some of those issues at least uh, over the coming uh, year. Thank you very much for that opener. Um, uh, uh, Dave Thompson, I want to ask your question just now. I know you've got yeah. a pressing yeah. engagement. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Good morning, Commissioner and, and colleagues. And apologies that I'll have to go just before uh, half past nine to, to another meeting. Um, my questions are. It's a fairly simple and small thing, I suppose, in many respects, and it's to do with crofting, croft, the crofting agricultural grant schemes for our very <coughs> uh, small uh, smallholders and crofts and so on. The, the regulations, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong in this, um, I think it's Commission Regulation 809-2014, Article 48.3, which requires, um, it's to do with verification, I suppose, it requires that any work that is done is completed and verified before the crofter can actually get the payment. Now, if you're talking about, say, uh, fencing uh, around a, a croft, replacing fencing and so on, you could be up to several hundred pounds, maybe more, maybe a thousand, and a lot of these crofters don't have that kind of money up front to be able to pay for the, the materials uh, or pay for someone to do it and then wait a while to get the cash back. And I can understand why, you know, the, the verification procedures and all the rest of it require, uh, you know, confirmation that work has been done. But I just wonder if there's any way that that can be adjusted whereby... Um, you know, money can be paid direct to a contractor or money could be paid to the supplier of the fencing materials directly on supply of those materials to the crofter to, to do the work or if the supplier could sort of uh, wait rather than the crofter having to do that. I just wonder if there's any way around that. Well, I'm glad to tell you that there is some flexibility. Well, it's up to your national authority. Okay. The Rural Development Programme allows you for, to provide the possibility of 50% of public aid as, adva as an advance for investment projects when approving the grant. That is before any costs have actually been incurred for the beneficiary, if the option is included in your Rural Development Programme. So you have to decide whether you want to include in the Rural Development Programme, and if so, you'll have a chance of getting 50% in advance, right. which will help to pay some of the upfront costs that you, men that you mentioned, and quite rightly mentioned that a lot of our smaller producers wouldn't have that sort of money in advance. So ah. there's potential there, if, but you need to talk to someone else. So I'll need, I'll need to rattle Richard Lockett. Yeah, I have to have a word with him, yes, yes. Get him at the show on good humour today. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed for that. That's very helpful, very thank useful. You. OK, uh, Mike Russell and then uh, Jamie McGregor. Uh, Commissioner, welcome, and I hope you enjoy your visit to, to, to the Highland Show today. The new... Application system, CAP application system, the computer system that's been introduced this year, uh, it clearly has been causing a great deal of heartache, and the committee heard from people about that two weeks ago. Uh, Scots are a fearfully law-abiding people, and uh, their greatest fear in this matter is that they will uh, inadvertently have made mistakes within the system, in a new system, and that uh, e e Europe, in, in the person of yourself, will penalise them for those innocent mistakes. I think the biggest message people will want to hear from you during your visit is that there is a flexibility within the system and an understanding within the system that will not lead to that type of um, uh, penalty being imposed this year. Because if it were to be imposed in the way that people fear, it would not only be bad for individual farmers and land managers, it would also be bad for the reputation of the system. This is a very big issue and I'm glad you raised it. Um, I already extended the application time by four weeks to reflect exactly the concerns you've expressed that people in member states were speaking to me about the difficulties in the timelines of the 15th of May and meeting all of the obligations of, and in, in respect of the application for aid. So responding to that, I gave a very generous extension of time. Some people were looking for a week. So I said, well, a week is not that long. So we gave four weeks. And hopefully we'll be able to get the controls done in time to allow payments to be made this year. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a new layer of 
information required in many respects because of the greening requirements. And uh, I mentioned earlier that I made some changes to the guidelines this year in order to give better clarification so that there would be less of an error rate, particularly in relation to hedges and adjacent roads. And, uh, but options are often taken by the member state uh, and by the government uh, that, you know, that are, that are not maybe different. They have other options and a lot of options that may not always take up uh, in terms of equivalents, in terms of the catch crops and protein crops that you're allowed in order to uh, take advantage of the flexibility that we've given to the member state. So choices in many respects in relation to what options you go and what road you go down are largely determined by the member state. Um, so the European taxpayers, of course, often wonder to know why we give all this money to farmers, you know, and the food industry. So we have to do our job to make sure that European taxpayers are satisfied that the money is protected. So therefore, there's a balance to be struck in terms of sound financial management and at the same time, less bureaucratic system. And I do subscribe to exactly what you said in relation to smaller producers in particular who have not a hell of a lot of land, not a lot to gain, I suppose, directly from the CAP, but they have to go through this particular same sort of procedures as a larger producer. So we're looking at ways maybe over the next year as part of my simplification agenda to try and see can we do something to assist people who don't, shouldn't have to go off and get all of the consultancy and the costs associated with that in order to do a really small job. Uh, and the penalties then have to be proportionate. And they're not proportionate in my view at the moment. So you will see that my top political priority in 2015 is simplification, but it includes the type of concerns that you've expressed on behalf of farmers. I think anybody who, there are three in this room, I think, who've been environment ministers, will know that simplification is, is much required. But it, it is a difficult thing to achieve. I remember a civil servant saying to me with some frustration once that I did not understand what a complex business simplification actually was. In that term, what can you do in a reasonable period of time, because people often get very frustrated by this, to make sure that their experience of the system is simpler and more direct? Can you because I know you have attributed this often to the desire by individual states to have complexity within the system because they have options, many options in the system. How can you bear down upon that within the individual member states to ensure that they are offering as simple a set of choices as possible? Can you do that? Well, what we, I, I certainly cannot do it on my own. I need the legislators who are the Council of Ministers in the European Parliament to agree to it if we have to open up the legislation again. What I'm trying to do this year, and what I can do, is to try and, in the, second, the area of secondary legislation and guidelines, make changes that will make it less difficult to understand, but also less burdensome on the member states as well as the farmer. Uh, I, you know, we have to achieve a number of objectives, but when you're going through the legislative process, 8,000 amendments were tabled to the, the recent Common Agricultural Policy. It's a much more complex document than the Commission proposed. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody, but this is the way that democracy works. If you want to have objectives achieved, you have to, you, may, you have to have, and which hasn't happened in the past, in my view, sufficiently, have one eye in relation to how it's going to be implemented and the concerns that farmers and food industry have in terms of the bureaucracy and the complexity involved in such an implementation. So that I'm asked now to try and unravel some of the complexity for a policy that just came into effect on the 1st of January last. So it's a, it's a major challenge, and uh, people tried it in the past and failed. But I'm going to do my best to try and make sure that particularly the smaller producer is able to cope with the type of scenarios, bureaucracy that's tied up in this particular policy at the moment, which is incrementally developed over time, and, and on the penalty side, to be able to be more proportionate in the event of a mistake being made in line with the... Uh, observations that you made about the, the, the 15th of June deadline and the, I'm sure there was smoke coming out of computers over the last few days in Scotland and all over the European Union to make sure that that deadline was hit. And I'm glad to say that your officials have done an outstanding job in, in making sure that the, you know, everybody that wanted to apply were able to get into the system at least. And we hope that they were able to get in nice and cleanly and that there'll be very few errors. Thank you. Um, Jamie McGregor and then uh, Sarah Boyag, because I can oh. see... Thank, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Hogan. Um, when you go to the show today, you'll see some wonderful livestock, particularly cattle and sheep. Um, and uh, do you think that the uh, new Scottish CAP system uh, is doing enough 
to maintain or even expand uh, the numbers of cattle and sheep being kept in Scotland, particularly in our hills, which is the, which are the, where the seed corn for the industry is produced. And um, despite EU subsidies, you know, which have been going on for a long time now, the numbers of cattle and sheep have been falling. And uh, this is particularly worrying in, in our sort of rather more remote rural areas, which de depend on those for their agricultural produ production. Well, I suppose we've given flexibility in the latest policy for national authorities and regional authorities to give additional support for people that are farming in the remote rural areas and in particularly in upland areas and areas of natural constraint called voluntary coupled support. So in addition to the normal direct payments, there is a potential there for member states to be able to give more money if you feel that there is a stress in that particular sector or there is uh, constraints that wouldn't otherwise be in your lowland areas. So already built into the policy is the flexibility for people to do something about it. Uh, and I do know that the beef sector here in Scotland is hugely important. Uh, it accounts for 26% of your total agricultural output. And I, uh, I think it was Mr. McLaren I met last night, the chairman of the Quality Meat Scotland, and they're doing an excellent job in relation to getting the, the high quality end of the beef market you know, you know, into the uh, type of markets and the protections that are, ne are needed through geographical indications as well in order to ensure that we have a product from Scotland that is, uh, is well recognised as the symbol of excellence. Uh, and uh, I applaud you for doing recent reports in order to try and see what we can do better on that. But we are giving €4 billion Euro to Scotland from the European Union. There is a significant flexibility now for the first time to tailor some sub additional support to the areas you're talking about if you wish to do so. So you have to, again, I suppose a bit like our crofters, you have to maybe have a chat with a few of your people in Scotland to see what can be done in tailoring that flexibility to help people that may be going through a difficult time. Well, just the point, I was just wondering if you could give outline in any way why you think that despite, despite the fact there have been increases in EU subsidies, the numbers of livestock are still going down. And is that the same in other European countries? Yeah, European consumption of beef is going down. So we have to do a little bit better in promotional programmes and quality assurance programmes right around not just the world but in the European Union itself. And I have mentioned uh, that I will be sending some officials to Scotland and elsewhere to look at how we can actually draw down some funds that are available on promotion and quality in order to advance the case for Scottish beef in international markets. And, and mutton as well. Well, you only mentioned beef. I didn't like to get into all the I mentioned that, sheep as well. Yeah, well, you didn't mention mutton. You mentioned mutton now. <laughs> <laughs> My hearing is not bad this morning, you know. <laughs> See the boy out. Yeah. But there is, there, is, there is chances through voluntary couple support and through better promotion funds available to help you there. And it's a market-orientated business we're in, and yeah. hopefully we can get better quality That's markets for Scottish products along the lines you mentioned. Uh, Sarah. Thank you very much, Convener, and welcome, Commissioner. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the overall objectives of um, common agricultural policy. And when it was initially started, it was about food production. Um, and now we're trying to look at food production and climate change, biodiversity. Um, but if we were thinking about the, the greening elements of it, I know there's more being done in, in Pillar 1, but when we speak to farmers, that is one of the hardest things for them is trying to meet a range of different objectives. But in terms of where Europe is as a, as a block, um, that mix of food production and climate change are the, are the twin challenges, I think, for us going forward. And it's how you see um, common agricultural policy and the changes that we're making is making that easier for farmers. Because on the ground, I think a lot of farmers, particularly small farmers, really struggle with the complexity of all the different things that they see that they have to do in terms of ticking the box. I agree with you that it is a complex policy and I've explained already how, what I'm trying to do and to concentrate all efforts and trying to make it more simple. That won't be easy. It's going to be, in, in sporting terms, it's going to be a rolling mall uh, over the, my mandate of five years to achieve these objectives. Uh, but we have objectives of producing, helping producers to produce top quality food that we can be proud of for European citizens, but also if we have some food left over which we have. We want to meet the challenges of 2050 of 9 billion population on this planet and who is going to feed them. And we want to make sure that European agriculture and food is well positioned to be able to meet those objectives. We have a moral obligation as well as a commercial 
uh, opportunity to do so. We have environmental objectives because if we don't have good environmental practice uh, on water quality and soil fertility, we're actually cutting off our nose to spite our face for the future. And we will have no ag agriculture, we'll have barren landscapes, and we don't want that, like they have in many states of the United States of America. Uh, and then we have territorial balance required in relation to jobs in rural areas, where under Pillar 2, we target a significant amount of resources for job creation outside of Farmgate. And I think one of the issues that I've, I, I, I think we can do a lot more on is to convey the view of that the CAP is not just for farmers. It's, above, it's for everybody urban and rural people, because food doesn't appear on the table in the quality that it does now by accident. The traceability regimes that European farmers have put in place are now second to none, and we have now a competitive advantage for the first time vis-a-vis -vis other uh, blocks of, uh, of, of countries around the world, in that we know that what we say is actually true, and that the farmer to the fork is actually, has the systems in place to make sure that they, those, are, those are actually put in place. I want to put food security as the centre of a political dialogue again in the European Union uh, to meet the objectives I've just, me uh, just mentioned. And of course you, can, you have to do that in the context of the new buzzword of sustainable intensification of agriculture and to meet the climate change objectives. So we are working closely. You, 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 get, a new, you get a new phrase every year in terms of what we're doing. Uh, but the, the, the Climate Commissioner and I are working closely together in the run-up to Paris at the end of the year to try and ensure that we have systems in place like low, you know, to ensure that agriculture is, at, is implementing policies that are generating low carbon intensity uh, and also our beef genomic scheme, for example, that you have in Ireland and Scotland is a perfect example of where we're actually planning for the future in terms of breeding programs that will reduce emissions. Uh, but we, we have a lot of incremental policies in different fragmented areas that we need to pull together in order to acknowledge that climate change is the biggest challenge to society and also how the contribution of agriculture can do that without you know, damaging the prospects of feeding the populations of the world in 2050. So it's a tricky balance and it will be interesting negotiations in Paris, uh, but we are working closely to, to try and achieve that. And again, I, I, I've indicated already to Michael that and I repeat to you, Sarah, that the small farmer is, in my view, uh, needs special attention in terms of the implementation of the present CAP, particularly around penalties. Uh, you know, if you have a greater than a 3% rate of penalty in relation to any mistake you make, uh, you know, a small farmer disproportionately in terms of their income suffers more than a larger producer. And that's not fair or proportionate, and we're trying to do something about it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Angus and then Claudia. So. Okay, um, thanks, Convener. Um, good morning again, Commissioner. Um, if I could just touch on, on the issue of GM crops. Um, we now have the new EU approach to regulation of the, the release into the environment of GMOs. Uh, and as you may be aware, um, Commissioner, there's, there's some conflict between the, the UK government and the, between the UK government stance and the Scottish government stance. Uh, on this. Could you give the committee an overview of, of how the new regime is operating, although it's quite recent, um, and how do you see it developing over your uh, term in office? Well, um, this is, is a very sensitive political issue, as you rightly point out, in relation to biotechnology. And we've had a, a system in place up to now where particularly licence applications from the United States uh, have we have approved them uh, up to some years ago, but the, the last commission decided that they were going to block them, even though they were science-based uh, in terms of their application. Uh, I'm in favour of a science-based solution to these matters, uh, but President Juncker has made it quite clear that there is a societal concerns that have been taken into account as much as the, the science, and that's a solution then that has generated in recent times a decision by the European Commission uh, not to allow the Council of Ministers to hide behind the, the European Commission, but we're putting the onus back on the Member States. So we're wheeling the scrum uh, in order to ask the Member State, you make your decision now in relation to whether you want to opt in or opt out. And I, I expect you'll have some interesting debate in the UK because you have differences of opinion in relation to that. Uh, and, uh, but it'll have to be done on the basis of each Member State in deciding what's best for its future. But before we get out of the traps at all, the Committee on Agriculture in the European Parliament and the Committee on the Environment will be making the, their initial views on these matters known in the next month. And my indications are, what I'm feedback and getting is that they're going to be against. 
the notion of changing the system uh, for the growth of GM crops or explicitly uh, promoting the notion of biotechnology uh, in the European Union. But the old system then will continue where applications can come in uh, from outside to the European Union in the normal way and that science will be, de will be determinant in whether they should be allowed for particularly for animal feed. If we don't have some of those soya bean crops coming in as part of our, of, our, of our animal feed, we're going to have a 20% increase in animal feed costs. And therefore, we make our industry more competitive and the concerns you have for the beef farmers in the mountain areas will accentuate even more. And I, well, I mean, you're, you're getting hung up in the sheep. Uh, but uh, there, is, there, there, is, there is certainly uh, likely to be, in my view, uh, no change for, for, uh, based on what I'm hearing in the European Parliament to the Council of Ministers uh, to the present regime, where we were a little bit politically schizophrenic. We, we don't mind eating GM crops if, are food, if the ingredients are imported, but we don't want to grow them ourselves. So I understand that. I'm a politician for 32 years. <laughs> okay, thank you. I just have a short supplementary on that. I mean, the, the problem is, I think, that, um, well, it leads on to the question about world trading conditions, really, because um, the TTIP is in our mind here. But we've got the, the, the situation where it's possible for the big uh, suppliers of uh, soya from Brazil to differentiate between what is GM and what is non-GM. And some firms like Waitrose, with all of its lines in this country, insist on a non-GM uh, source of soya. And they're able to achieve this. But it seems that the vast bulk of supermarkets in this country have thrown in the towel and allowed Cargill and other big companies just to un give them undifferentiated uh, soya uh, from Brazil. Surely there must be some way in which the European uh, Union can bring to bear uh, its weight to make sure that it's possible for people to buy non-GM soya if they so choose? Absolutely. It's not my direct responsibility. It's DG Sante and Commissioner Andrea Kaisers that directly deals with this, but I give you my opinion uh, in relation to these matters as well. But labelling is crucially important in terms of dealing with these issues. And we can reform our labelling system to meet the objectives that you have enunciated. And I think that's the way to go. Uh, but we can't get away from the fact that it's going to produce what you're asking is to produce a product that's going to cost a lot more. It's that's the choice that the consumer can make. It's not questionable. No, it's not questionable. Because a, but it's, it's a choice that the consumers are entitled to have. If they want to pay a bit more, like organic production, uh, that's their choice. But, but, then, but they should know what they're buying. Yes. Um, Sarah Bayat wanted to follow up on that point. Yeah, yeah just um, the, the issue of TTIP has been something that a lot of our constituents have been writing to us about, and your analogy about something that costs much more. Um, I mean, we have very high animal welfare standards, and there's strong public support for that, and there's always going to be a balance between cost and quality. But, you know, the shift to free-range eggs was very much a consumer-driven issue, and I think there is a concern that people do want to know where food has come from and I think it was very welcoming that in your opening remarks you talked about the strength of the quality of the Scottish food products and I think we're, we're very keen that we have a fair system where we don't have our producers being undercut by a lack of traceability or um, different inputs to the agricultural system that are not clear to consumers and I think there's, you know, there are concerns about human health as well as um, I, you know, in terms of the people that are working in our food production industry. Um, and I think it's quite an important issue for us and be wondering where, you, where we are in terms of the agricultural elements of the TTIP negotiations. Well, first of all, as you can see, the United States are finding it very difficult to get agreement on anything at the moment in relation to trade. The fast-track promotion authority legislation is in trouble. They're even in trouble with the Pacific countries and under TPP. So we're the third plane on the runway, TTIP. And time is running out between now and campaigning in the presidential election for 2016, and that's the reality. My personal view is that I don't think we'll have a, an outcome of TTIP that's comprehensive between now and February or January 2016. But we continue to be open because European, the Europeans should not be afraid of exports. Uh, for every euro exported, it creates jobs, not the other way around. 
And we have a flat European economy, largely because we're not exporting enough. But I'm glad to say that European agriculture, for the first time, with the help of Scottish whisky, uh, is actually now outstripping all other blocks in terms of exports. We're the highest exporter in the world of food and drink, and the highest importer as well. So we are in a key position. But we're competitive now for the first time in 20 years. And we're now able to take on the challenges of the United States. We're not afraid of them anymore in terms of competitiveness. Uh, but we want to be treated as equals. So if we're going to have, uh, I can assure you that the standards of food and drink that are in the European Union will be protected in any deal, uh, whenever that deal happens. Uh, we are not going to, you know, the sacrifices that farmers have made and the efforts that have, uh, national administrations have made to provide traceability after foot and mouth and BSE, we're not going to throw that away. We, uh, you know, and we come under pressure from the United States for hormone beef, and you know, uh, and we resist that successfully, reasonably so. There's only a small amount of of, of hormone-free beef that's now in a quota that for Australia, Argentina, Uruguay, and the United States and. The United States can often get quite upset that they're not getting more of this quota, but because they're not competitive enough is the real reason, but they want to blame the European Union for not implementing a, an agreement that's compatible with WTO rules. Uh, so labelling and standards of food as part of any particular TTIP outcome or any other free trade agreement, whether it is Brazil or Indonesia, you can take it that we will be protecting those standards. And also our GIs, I want to also, our GIs, uh, which is very important to Scotland, I have said this on two occasions that I've been in the negotiations with the United States. There will be no deal unless we're satisfied on GIs. So they, the ball is in their court to satisfy us on that issue. Uh, Claudia Beamish and then Mike Russell. Thank you, Kavina. Uh, good morning, Commissioner and colleagues. Uh, you've uh, highlighted the importance of um, uh, both food production and climate change and biodiversity imperatives. <laughs> Um, and talked about the balance there, and I wonder the degree to which we can move towards a fusion where um, all farmers are working for all of it at once. Um, I am an optimist. <laughs> um, and, and in that context, I'm wondering about um, if you have a view, Commissioner, on the, the, um, the value and, or, or not uh, in the present circumstances of any mandatory on-farm reporting on emissions um, with, uh, as you know, our agriculture emissions um, form, uh, I think it's 23.4% of our emissions which were reported um, the week, last week. And uh, it is obviously uh, about behaviour change, but also behaviour change means taking people with us, you know. So I wonder uh, about your comment, comments on mandatory reporting. Uh, and also, if you could shed any light on how you think um, the... The, our committee might be able to relate to the um, forthcoming Paris negotiations and, and we're very keen to, um, if not be there, which we would like to be, some of us, I, I believe, but uh, also how, how we can actually make a contribution um, as, as a committee, if you have any thoughts on that. Mm. Well, I think the way that the, your committee can make a contribution to any particular event but particularly such an important event as the climate change negotiations in Paris is to, is to ensure that your views are actually part of the mandate of negotiations for your member state. So you first of all have to influence your own mandating, mandate in relation to this matter. Now, I, as a former Minister for the Environment in Ireland, I had regular discussions with your people here in the UK, particularly Mr Davies, who had quite a lot of ambition in relation to climate change matters, maybe more so than some of the people in the UK. Uh, and uh, he, 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 uh, his views and I and mine were, were, were fairly close. Uh, but we have to be also uh, mindful of the fact that a behavioural change doesn't happen easily or overnight. It, and it, when you're giving some financial support, is the best time to concentrate the minds. Uh, it's amazing the number of farmers that actually can change their pattern behaviour on the environment when there's a few few pieces of sterling involved um, and uh, you know the check is in the post always helps uh, and that's the that's the time to grab the attention and you know that with mutton as well <laughs> uh, and whether it's couple support or whether direct payments or 30 percent of our, of our CAP now for environmental reasons there's good reasons for that uh, because people do actually take note of these and they'll there will there will be a lot of uh, 
uh, gnashing of teeth in relation to the obligations required. But again, people will fill that form if there's money in it. And if it happens to achieve uh, an environmental objective, well, that's great, in my view. Uh, but mandatory, mandatory reporting on farm, uh, I have to, I'd have to be very careful about that one because it does constitute an additional burden on people at a time when I'm trying to simplify the policy. Uh, you know, but there is no ways in which you can calculate your carbon intensity on farms in a voluntary way. And I think more and more farmers are actually getting used to the notion through application, app technology, and, uh, and, 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 and all of these new technologies that they're able to, phone technologies, that they know it's a competitive advantage for them now in order to sell their product if they have all this information, where they're able to show the consumer that you know, they've complied with good environmental standards and that they have able to give the figures themselves in relation to it. So I think that's a selling point. And uh, the, it's, if you're getting more of a premium price for your product arising from this information, that will be enough to do the behavioural change. So it comes down to the financial outcome uh, arising from decisions that are made on farm. And if it's positive, I can assure you that, that you'll see uh, a major move towards behavioural change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike Russell and then Graham D. <coughs> can I move on just a little to the question of dairy farming? Um, there is, um, as you know, uh, very substantial problems in the Scottish dairy sector, um, and this is intensified particularly in the rural parts of the Scottish, really rural parts of the Scottish dairy sector, the areas of uh, Kintyre and the island of Butte, which I represent, are perhaps the worst effect. Indeed, the island of Butte is the worst affected, with the lowest price that's being paid by a single provider, which is a single um, uh, processor, which is First Milk. Um, those farmers want to know very clearly how close we are to any intervention in terms of the price of milk uh, because on the price of production at approximately 24 or 25 pence a litre, uh, the payment they're receiving is probably something around 16 pence a litre at the present time, and that's obviously unsustainable. Some of this comes from um, what I was fascinated by your phrase, what I think could be called unsustainable intensification of the dairy sector over a long period of time, but some comes from world forces which are clearly strong, um, closure of the Russian market, for example, and matters like that. First of all, in the short term, where are we in dairy? Uh, what hope is there for assistance for the dairy sector? And secondly, what is your own view of where dairy prices will go over the medium term? Well, first of all, I do acknowledge there's a serious problem in the UK in relation to dairy. And part of it is down to your structures. You know, I think that there could be a significant look at the structures in terms of cooperatives and private companies and how they behave in the marketplace. We have insufficient uh, structures, in my view, in terms of bringing farmers together in a cooperative basis to, 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 do, to do things in a way that I would be used to and perhaps in another jurisdiction. Uh, and I think that, that's, a, that's a, I suppose that's a medium and long-term strategy that doesn't satisfy the farmer to, today or tomorrow. Uh, in the medium term, I see that there's going to be continuous volatility it's not because of the abolition of milk quotas. It's because of the global market trends uh, in recent times, uh, particularly in the Far East and Russia, that have contributed to these problems. But also, I think that there's, there's, there's issues to be looked at in the food chain. And I, I, I welcome very much the UK groceries adjudicator being part of your legislative process. And we're watching this very closely in the European Commission to see what we can learn from it. And if we need it, you know, EU common rules and a framework that we can lay down for other member states. So the UK and Spain are the leaders in trying to do something about ensuring that, uh, you know, that producers are not squeezed between retailers and processors. Uh, so well, that needs a bit more time probably to work as well through. I, do, I am optimistic in relation to the, uh, you know, the latter part of this year and going, going forward on prices of milk, <coughs> because I do see the far eastern market opening up to more opportunities when you consider 150 million people are going to be in middle class uh, income brackets each year for the next 30 years. The growing possibilities that that gives to western type products is actually enormous, provided we can get it of course at the right price, but I think we can. Uh, we are competing a lot better now with New Zealand uh, in this part of the world. Uh, they've had a drought as well, uh, and uh, California's had a drought. So. 
all of that feeds into giving European Union farmers a, a little bit of an advantage later on. And I, I suspect the Chinese will open up their powder markets in the near future again. Their stocks are now gone low, and therefore, you know, they're in a position to start buying again. But the worrying trends, definitely, that you've articulated for the last six months on the global market auctions are something I, I'd prefer not to see. But I have tools uh, that I can use, intervention, um, export refunds, aids to private storage. And we did open aids to private storage for cheese last September, which didn't work out great, because a lot of the people that weren't directly affected by the Eurasian market jumped in and gobbled up an awful lot of the money that was available for that particular scheme. But we learned from that, and we go a more targeted approach now in future if we have to do so. Um, so the Baltic states and the UK seem to be suffering the most on milk prices, but I'm not going to give any commitment here that I'm able to intervene immediately. I'm just waiting to see can we get washed through this volatility that's there at the moment, uh, and hopefully farmers can hang on a little longer for to see uh, arising from the 7th of August next, when the R Russians have to decide what they're going to do about extending the ban or adding to it, or so hopefully subtracting from it, uh, that would give us an opportunity to review the supports. The, there is, are some labelling issues in this, which the Commission should at least be aware of. Uh, you, the labelling is a difficult issue in this Parliament in terms of uh, the powers of this Parliament. But, for example, a uh, cheese, uh, cheese and, and yoghurt um, sold as, particularly cheese sold as Scottish cheese produced in parts of Scotland, can be made from milk that's imported from Northern Ireland. And, uh, you know, we, we have the, the Scottish agricultural industry so far has been unable to change that process. Now, there is a, a launch of a new Scottish um, um, dairy products brand at the Highland Show today, I think, today or tomorrow, uh, but it would be important that the Commission is aware that this um, fluidity of presentation can be quite damaging and there needs to be a stronger Scottish presence in people's minds in terms of the dairy sector. Robert Graham, who runs one of the more successful Scottish dairy companies, has sat in that very seat and uh, and said to the committee some time ago during our dairy inquiry that it was perfectly possible in, in, in Scotland to buy a, a range of, of products, English butter, Irish butter, of course, French butter, uh, but it was very difficult in England to buy Scottish butter. And uh, we need to make sure there is a much stronger Scottish brand. Any help that can, Europe can give us, the Commission can give us for that, I think would be very welcome. We're not going to be too helpful to you on that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, sorry to give you a bad news on this. We did a, two reports recently, my Commissioner Andrew Kaisers and I, which come down come totally against the country of origin labelling uh, because of the administrative costs, the additional costs on business, and uh, you know against the principle of subsidiarity. If we are trying to reduce the burden on member states and producers, it goes completely against that. So I know Minister Eustace was taking the matter on behalf of the UK, and I had to remind him of this as somebody that may be not enthusiastic about Europe, that we're trying to save him from himself in this one. <laughs> so it's... Uh, well, I'm enthusiastic about Europe. <laughs> I know that, I know that. But uh, I can't do everything. <laughs> but I, I, I want to be honest with you that uh, you know, this would have a serious chance of not being successful, sec successful in the context of the of European Union discussion on this matter because of the reasons I've said, and backed up now by various reports that we've done recently to test the country of origin uh, system. But voluntary labelling, I suppose, is the best way we can go at the moment, and that's a matter for the Member State. OK, that's interesting. Um, Angus MacDonald has a supplementary on this. Yeah, on, on the milk intervention price, sorry to go back to, um, to, to milk, but you did say that you're, you're, uh, you were unable to give a commitment to intervene on the milk price, um, which is understandable. However, um, I'm curious as to, to, to hear your views on, the, on whether or not there's any scope to uh, increase the intervention level when there are a serious crises like we're in just now uh, or, or when the, the price volatility is, uh, is at a, a serious level. Um, should, <coughs> surely it is an option that, um, that could be considered, perhaps. Yes, it is an, op an option that can be considered. We can also consider the crisis reserve, which is 433 million of farmers' money, in order to support product prices as well, which was a, an option that was looked at in the context of the Russian ban, which I got changed in the first two weeks of my office. Uh, I think the foreign policy and security decision should not be paid for by farmers because they're the ones that are directly affected. It should be paid for by the general European taxpayer, and that's what I succeeded in doing. 
So we haven't resorted to the crisis reserve. But when I asked an interesting discussion in the European Council uh, of Agricultural Ministers some time ago, and I asked them to define crisis, and none of them were able to do it, uh, keeping their options open on the definition of crisis. Uh, so uh, this, is a, this doesn't help, but I suppose it's understandable politically that you, you, you do want to say something more about a crisis in the future, but we have tools available. We continue to keep it under review, but the next chance I will get, I think, to look at it intensively is in the context of the review of the Russian ban on the 7th of August. Okay. Thank you. Graham Day. I thank you, Kim Good morning, Commissioner. Morning. The EU consultation on endocrine disruptors is causing quite considerable concern within the Scottish soft fruit sector. Um, I don't think anybody in this room would question the need to limit usage, but uh, Responsible soft fruit growers in my constituency already only use endocrine disruptors as a last resort, and they contain that usage to within polytunnels. And the Agriculture and, Hortico uh, Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board's modelling uh, in the UK forecasts that, depending on whichever of the suggested scenarios would, was implemented, crop yield could fall by between 40 and 89 per cent. So I'm wondering where we are on endocrine disruptors and whether account of this sort of impact on soft fruit production will be considered, and on a related matter, could you advise us on the latest position with neonicotinoids? Again, it's not my direct responsibility, but I'm glad to give you whatever information I have on it. I, this is the subject of a, an EFSA review at the moment, a science review, which, when will it be finished, do you think? Um, in relation to neonicotines, the process started probably September of next year, Commissioner. We finished? In the... Yes. So you're talking about a year's work to be done in terms of coming to conclusions on this. But it is a, it, it does come up regularly in discussions with Commissioner Andrew Kaitis, again in DG Sante, and we will get the latest state of play. We will send it to you directly. It's probably the best. I don't want to be giving you uh, information that may, may, be, may be different than what the latest state of play is. But in the context of the F EFSA review and the timelines, we'll send you directly a note on it. Right. Is that covering the endocrine disruptors yeah, as well? Yeah, it would send you everything. Yeah. But, but from, from your portfolio's perspective, you are aware of the potential damage that the outcome of this could have on, on crop production. Well, I am aware of a lot of potential problems that can be the responsibility of others. <laughs> OK. So, but, we, but we are fully across supporting the Commissioner and trying to come to early decisions and quick decisions. But the trouble is, as you know, impact assessments, evaluation, all these take exactly. time and they're in that process of the, at the moment. But we'll give you a full, more detailed note okay. that maybe we'll give plant health and animal health is not, even though I have a direct involvement in the export of these matters, I don't, in the context of growing them and the conditions in which they're growing is a matter for somebody else. And okay. We have been lobbied on two or three separate occasions and we're engaged with Santa in relation to it. And we've seen the NFU report. Uh, we know the importance of the toolbox, the availability of those products. But the issue around neonics is as much about the bee population as anything else, and given security around that. And at the moment, the, the jury's out on that, and that's why the EFSA review is going to take place. I can just illustrate why I've raised this. If you take the soft fruit sector, um, the impact uh, of neonicotinoids in the bee population, as an example, for one company in my constituency, has led to them having to spend £100,000 creating artificial bee environments around their polytunnels. So they've had a hit from that. Now they could be faced with an issue from endocrine disruptors affecting their crop yield. That's where I'm going with this. And part of the impact assessment will be to, to look at what the alternatives are. Right. So the toolbox won't be left bare. So that'll be part of the process as well. Yeah, because a lot of the soft fruit growers are actually working themselves to develop alternatives quite, yes. quite successfully. But they do say Biological to Biological control, etc. Yeah, but they do say they need that as a fallback position, some access to that. Have they got, I presume they have made a submission to the European yeah. consultation process yeah. as well. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, you know, perhaps as a final question just now, because we are short of time, is to address an issue that perhaps affects people across Europe, but affects us here. It relates particularly to the rocketing uh, of land prices in farming. And uh, I assume that that's related partly <laughs> to the certainty of subsidies um, in the period up to 2020. Now, we see a vast increase in prices far beyond the economic worth of the land concerned. And I'm sure in Ireland that it's actually worse than it is in Scotland. 
but I'm wondering whether, in fact, there could be a significant difference in the kind of levels of support after 2020 that might actually interfere with this uh, spiral of land prices far beyond the economic value of the land that's actually being worked. This is a huge issue for young farmers in particular, yes. in terms of getting access to land. And you know, there's a mixture of policies, whether at national level, regional level, or European level, that must be taken into account. First of all, at national level, you have tax incentives that you can for long-term leasing, or partnership agreements, uh, which would get uh, some young people into the world of agriculture. Second of all, access to finance or credit is a huge problem for people that are starting out. And we're doing something with the European Investment Bank at the moment in order to give priority to a new fund. For the first time, the EIB are going to have a new fund for agriculture, where they're going to target financial support uh, through your high street bank, which that will be designated by the EIB, to give a new source of finance to young farmers who have to implement some investment on their farms and are starting up, or to get access to money to be able to get access to land. So we are very conscious of that in terms of generational renewal as well. So there's a series, there's a suite of policies there that are required in a shared way between the European Union and the Member States, which we're willing to explore and anxious to explore to meet the, the challenges that you've mentioned in relation to this. Now, I don't want a situation to arise where you get access to finance and credit and it drives land prices even more in the wrong direction. So we have to be conscious of that as well in terms of how we tailor the product. Uh, but I think in the, short, in the short term, in order to get access to land for young people, we have to do something in terms of long-term leasing, partnerships, early retirement. You, know, you won't get a young person uh, access to land unless the older generation are actually secure. That's where it will be triggered from. It will be triggered from the older people to the younger people, not the other way around. Uh, and we had good schemes in the past that uh, ran their course in terms of the early farm retirement scheme. I thought it was an excellent scheme in Ireland anyway, in terms of mobilising a lot of activity in a partnership way, uh, where, you, in a, where you, before you got the state pension, at least you were able to get a, another form of security with the help of the European Union. So we're looking at, in the context of structural reform and generational renewal, some options here in the next year that will hopefully meet some of your requirements that you alluded to. Thank you very much. I think that's um, taken us round quite a lot of the houses just now. Um, it's been very helpful for us to get a flavour of what you're doing. And uh, in Scotland here, we have, you know, very great pride in the achievements of agriculture and the food industry as such. And we hope that uh, we can get your support, recognising that uh, sometimes there may be differences with uh, uh, the member state in London from our particular priorities, but that uh, indeed we are communitaire in Scotland and that we want to make sure that we've got the opportunities for our farmers uh, going forward. So when we hear uh, you know, the, 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 the story that you relate just now, some of it gives us hope and uh, some of it gives us you know, reassurance that uh, you're thinking these things through for our benefit. So thank you very much, Phil, well, for I coming to see us. I want to thank you, Chairman, and members of your committee for uh, been so diligent on the day of a Royal Highland show to be here to meet me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we appreciate the interaction with every... I, I try my best to go to uh, Parliament in every place I visit to hear the views of the public representatives. As one for 32 years, I value very much the experience you have and the interaction you have with your constituents, who, not just in the pub, but on the farm, uh, where you hear all of the information that's very valuable for policy discourse and implementation measures, in particular on the CAP. Uh, and uh, I look forward very much to visiting your show today to see uh, the showcase for what is best of Scottish farming. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, thank you, and to your support staff as well. Um, we have a future meeting next week before the recess uh, at the next meeting of the committee on the 24th of June, and our last before the recess, we will be considering four pieces of subordinate legislation, uh, PE 01490 on the control of wild geese numbers and our work programme to finish up. So I close the meeting at this stage. Thank you.